Waves of Destiny, Change. After slamming the door on what had to be the world's first aquatic doorstep salesman, selling, of all things, motherhood, I leaned back, trying to catch my breath. My heart was doing the samba against my ribcage, not from fear, but from the sheer lunacy of it all. Mermaid babies needing human moms? I scoffed under my breath, shaking my head. The idea seemed ripped straight out of a fantasy novel, not something you'd encounter in your own backyard in Ghana. As darkness swallowed the edges of my meticulously maintained lawn, I tried to distract myself with a book, then a movie, but my thoughts kept drifting back to the poolside encounter. Curiosity, that treacherous friend, nudged me towards the window. Peeking out, I half expected the knight to have swallowed him and his outlandish request whole. Yet there he was, rising from the depths of the pool, water streaming down his form in rivulets that caught the moonlight, making him shimmer. His dreadlocks, like woven ropes, clung to the contours of his muscular chest, outlining his physique in the soft lunar glow. If this was a dream, it was one heck of a vivid one. Kweku, the merman and father, exuded a steadfast presence his gaze lifting towards my window with an uncanny certainty, as if sensing my eyes on him at that precise moment. Startled by the intensity of his stare, I recoiled, the window slamming shut in my haste. Despite my resolve, curiosity drew me back to the window once more, only to find he had vanished. My gaze drifted to the waves and the vast expanse of the ocean beyond, a deep knowing settling within me that this time he had gone. It's better this way, I thought. Boys can really throw you for a loop. Thank goodness, Mom had given me a heads up about situations like this in a way. Once they think you're helping them, that's when the signals start to get all tangled and confusing. That's when they sink their teeth in. Sequestered within the vast confines of my home, I vowed to not let the previous day's surreal encounter dictate my life. The house was spacious enough to keep me occupied, but isolation was a choice I refused to make. After a day spent mostly indoors, wrestling with thoughts that bordered on the fantastical and the absurd, I decided it was time to reclaim my routine. The next morning unfurled like any other, with the comforting ritual of breakfast, followed by my customary walk by the sea, an attempt to wash away the lingering confusion. Yet, as I approached the shore, my steps involuntarily slowed, the large rock where Kweku had once sat loomed ahead, empty. Despite myself, I felt a tug of disappointment when I passed it, my gaze invariably flicking back in hopes of disproving his absence. The rock had begun to haunt me with ethereal visions of the mesmerizing merman, his surreal piercing eyes focused on me. After my swift retreat indoors that day, leaving a bewildered Kweku and his mermaid baby at the edge of my pool, I couldn't deny it any longer. Kweku's proposition had burrowed deep into my thoughts, occupying every silent moment. And now, faced with his absence, a surprising sense of loss enveloped me. How many girls find themselves courted by a beautiful merman, offering not just any proposition, but motherhood to a being from another realm? The baby, with her curious gaze that seemed to recognize me, was undeniably adorable. She. I corrected myself mentally, a smile tugging at my lips at the memory. But if all that Kweku had said was true, would her life really be at risk if I didn't help them? I couldn't live with myself knowing I could have done something, but instead let a baby die, mermaid or otherwise. I could tell this was going to give me nightmares. Easy, Ama. I whispered to myself. Keep it together. She'll be fine. Surely he must have found someone else by now or another way, a better way. Resigned to let the matter go, for what choice did I have with him gone? I turned back towards home. That's when I saw him, Kweku, perched on the very rock I had just wished him to occupy, his gaze fixed towards my house before shifting onto me, our eyes locked, a wordless conversation in the brief eternity before I broke the silence. Okay, Let's say I consider your proposal, I found myself saying before I even fully registered stepping up to him. My voice wobbled, a tightrope walker balancing skepticism and an inexplicable pull towards the absurd. 
What does being a mermaid baby's mother entail? I don't know the first thing about any of this. I mean, do I have to swim with her daily or teach her what? Mermaid etiquette? His smile, in response, was gentle, illuminating an already sunny day. It's not about teaching her to be a mermaid. It's about giving her what any child needs. Love, care, a sense of belonging. The sea will teach her the rest. I couldn't help but notice his composure. How could Kweku remain so serene, his tone so effortlessly calm? It appeared that I was the sole contender wrestling with the gravity of the situation. I laughed, a sound more nervous than I intended. You do realize how crazy this sounds, right? How crazy all of this is. I'm trying to graduate high school, not raise a baby mermaid as a surrogate mom. I have exams to think about, a future to plan. My life is complicated enough without adding this. Kweku's eyes fixed on me. I recognize the many obligations and responsibilities that tether you to land, Ama, he began, the gravity of his plea evident in his voice. And I've considered that I shouldn't come to you. Yet, in all the vastness of both our worlds, you're the only being I've been drawn to, the only one in existence who can save my daughter's life. Please, he said, I need you, Ama. She's already been motherless for far too long, and her essence is fading as we speak. My heart raced, the urgency in his voice sinking into me while I battled with the reality of it all, his belief that I could save his daughter by bonding with her. The absurdity of our conversation danced around me like the morning breeze. All right, Kweku. I'll try it, I said after a long pause, the words tasting strange on my tongue. But don't get your hopes up. Just so you know, you're looking at someone whose own mother insists that I don't know how to take care of myself, much less a helpless baby. But if I can really save her, then I guess it'll be worth it. You better pray or something if that's something merfolk do. And just so we're clear, I'm not doing this for you. My voice was suddenly a mix of determination and a twinge of defiance. It's for her. His response caught me off guard, soft yet insightful. That's entirely acceptable. Having her best interest at heart is what being a mother is all about. You're already excelling in that regard. But I'm curious, he continued, his voice deep, a gentle inquiry rather than an accusation, why you felt it necessary to clarify that you're not doing this for me. I found myself unable to answer, rendered speechless for the billionth time while trapped in the intensity of his deep chocolate gaze that seemed to see right through me. Is it because you're in love with me? The question hit me like a wave, leaving me sputtering in disbelief. What? The word escaped in a gasp as I choked on my shock. Struggling to wrap my mind around his proposition, my heart was racing as I prepared to dismiss his outrageous claim. But before I could firmly articulate my denial, Kweku's next confession, laced with sudden tenderness, swept over me, igniting another fit of coughing. It's all right if you are. I want you to love me with the same intensity, the same depth that consumes me when I think of you. My feelings for you have been raging quietly for far longer than you could possibly imagine. Each word from him was a bolt out of the blue, jolting me into a state of turmoil. Through my squinted eyes, blurred by the effort to control my coughs, Kweku's gaze held steady, wrapped in that same sincere honesty that had marked our first encounter. It wasn't just his words, but the earnestness behind them that threw me into chaos. Panic took a physical form as I stepped back, my hand raised in a silent plea for a pause, for a breath. He obliged, and in the stillness that followed, I found my voice, though it wavered with disbelief. What are you saying? His bluntness left me struggling, adrift in uncertainty. You can't just say things like that to me. Is this how merfolk talk, or is this some kind of joke? My mind raced, desperate for a way out of the emotional vortex Kweku had stirred. The baby, yes, that was my exit from this overwhelming confrontation. Shifting the focus to something, anything else, felt like the only way to anchor myself against the tide of Kweku's too direct affection. Without warning, heat washed over me, and I broke out into a sweat, the sudden change leaving me even more disoriented. 
In a clumsy attempt to regain some control over the conversation and my own racing heart, I blurted out, Anyway, about the baby. My voice trailed off, my attempt to change the subject as awkward as it was transparent. In that moment, faced with Kweku's unwavering declaration of love, I realized I had no idea how to respond. Forget it, I said. My point is I'm doing this just because of the baby. She's really so cute, and I missed her. That's all. End of story. And she you, he replied, not pursuing my answer, I realized, his voice carrying over the sound of the waves. She told me so. She said that? She talks? I said, surprised. He shook his head, a small smile playing on his lips as naturally as if he hadn't just completely dumbfounded me with his abrupt love confession. No, but I can understand her since I'm her father. Okay. I took a moment, using the word as a lifeline, to gather my thoughts and steady my breath, then said, That moment by the pool the other day, when I first held her, it felt as though she understood me. Is that possible? Yes, he confirmed softly. Still calm as ever, a hint of warmth in his voice. It's natural for her to understand you. But she's so young. My confusion must have been evident, as Kweku quickly clarified, It's a mermaid thing. She sees you as her mother. Could we, perhaps, not rush into labeling me as her mother? I countered. It feels bizarre, like I'm back in kindergarten playing house. Choosing to overlook his puzzled reaction, I said, Anyway, now that this is happening, I'll need to know more. How do we even begin to do this? We'll figure it out step by step. For now, just spend time with her. It'll need to be a majority of your time as it's not me she needs now. Let her get to know you. The bond will form naturally. As I agreed to his request, a part of me wondered if I had lost my mind. Yet another part felt a flicker of excitement at the unknown path unfolding before me. Thank you, Ama. His relief was unhidden, a wave crashing against the shore. So, where is she? I asked. Kweku gave me a look then a blend of amusement and disbelief painting his face. You've only just noticed she's missing? His question took me by surprise, my eyes flitting from his empty arms to the vast sea behind him. After our entire conversation, you realize now that your baby is not with me? I could feel my cheeks warm with embarrassment. We definitely need to work on your motherly attentiveness, he teased. For the first time, I saw a smirk playing on his impossibly perfect lips. My eyes stopped their frantic search when his glance subtly directed me toward the pool, silently revealing where she was. You already put her in the pool? I exclaimed. And all this while, you were watching my house because you knew I'd change my mind? I didn't, he confessed, his voice softening. I hoped you would. His words, wrapped in hopeful sincerity, made me chuckle despite the situation. Here I was, getting lectured on attentiveness by a merman who had stealthily returned his daughter to my pool, banking on a change of heart I hadn't even admitted to myself yet. As Kweku requested a moment and plunged back into the sea, I watched, perplexed but patient, until he re-emerged, settling himself atop the rock again. The realization hit me that he might have been out of the water longer than was comfortable for him. With him settled, curiosity peaked once more, I ventured, what's her name? His reaction was unexpectedly evasive. Instead of a simple answer, his gaze flickered guiltily away from me and towards the pool. At the moment, she doesn't yet have a name. I couldn't mask my disbelief. Why not? It seemed so basic, so fundamental. Yet here we were. He explained, it's the responsibility of both parents to name a child once born. You have to name her with me, he said with a solemnity that took me aback. I actually don't have to do anything of the sort. In fact, I think we need to sign a formal contract before we proceed any further. You never mentioned anything about naming her before. My response was more sharp than I intended, because of my surprise. Kweku just sat there, a silent sentinel on the rock, seemingly waiting for my flurry of emotions to settle. You're serious about this? I asked, my voice softening despite myself. He nodded, unfazed by my earlier outburst. Fine then, I said, 
a bit rashly, gazing out at the ocean for inspiration. Ocean, I announced, my hand gesturing towards the vast water before flopping lazily to my side. He shook his head. It's not that simple. The name must come from your heart, and it must be something both of us agree on. This takes time and can only be done through love. That way, the baby will accept it, and it will guide her through her life. It's a mermaid thing, I interrupted before he could finish, a mix of sarcasm and resignation in my voice. That night, as I tossed and turned in my bed, sleep remained frustratingly out of reach. The day's events played on a loop in my head, with Kweku's confession taking center stage, its echoes haunting me. Again and again, I revisited our exchange. What are you saying? The question, my feeble attempt at clarity, now echoed mockingly in the quiet of the night. Burying my face into my pillow, I sulked, at my inability to come up with a more composed reply, even now. But how was I supposed to react, and why had I started sweating? What was the expected response to such a declaration in the way that he had delivered it? Silence, apparently. Never before had I reacted to a boy this way. It's not like boys hadn't flirted with me before or tried to date me saying all manner of things, but Kweku, with his otherworldly allure, was unlike anyone I'd ever encountered. He just flat out confessed his love to me and told me he wanted me to love him back. I wasn't prepared. My whole life I had steered clear of boys, a decision fueled by the belief that they were nothing but distractions, obstacles en route to my college aspirations. Yet, here was Kweku, habitually stunning me into silence, breaching my defenses in ways I hadn't thought possible. Boys were trouble. And supernatural ones? Clearly, yes, even them. No, especially them. Apparently, they were so potent this one had already managed to give me a baby from twenty feet away. Just a dip in the pool, and suddenly I'm a mother. I sat up then, convincing myself I had this under control. It's the baby that I want to help. She's the cute one with her gurgles and the smile. I'm in this to make sure she gets to survive. That's the only reason I can't turn away. My reputation is still intact. I have no weakness for boys or for Kweku. It's for the baby. Once she gets her force field thing, Kweku will be free to whisk her away to whatever aquatic depths they hailed from. There, I said, on stealing my resolve. That done, an undeniable pull drew me to the poolside, where I found myself kneeling, whispering to the tiny being in my pool, in the stillness of the night. Her small form curled up at the bottom of the pool. She looked like a living doll. I found myself wanting to go into her, cuddle her at least. Maybe she was cold. Was this how they slept? Kweku was nowhere to be seen. I couldn't imagine this was the correct way to leave a young baby sleeping. A mother would cuddle her. Right? Regardless, it wasn't something I could fix. It wasn't as if I could breathe underwater to stay down there with her, and Kweku had made it clear that she couldn't stay out of the water for long. Already feeling overwhelmed. Listen, I said softly, talking to the baby. I don't have a clue about what to do with you. I don't know the first thing about being a mother, just so you know. As I looked down at the sleeping mermaid baby, her breaths tiny puffs of magic in the water, she looked so tiny and helpless that I couldn't quite shake the worry that I was going to do something wrong. Standing up, I searched for Kweku's presence, a sensation that had felt so constant but now was conspicuously absent. Realizing he was serious about everything he had said, including the part where the baby would need to spend most of her time with me, I let out a sigh. Walking back inside, I acknowledged the baby's peaceful slumber, trusting that Kweku wouldn't have left her there if it wasn't safe. Hopefully, she would sleep until morning. Startled awake by the sudden noise, my heart leaped into my throat. Rain. Not the gentle patter I usually found comforting enough to make me snuggle back into bed, but a fierce, relentless downpour that immediately spiked my anxiety to record levels. Panic seized me with a single, all-consuming thought. The baby. Springing into action, I dashed downstairs, my feet barely touching the steps, and burst through the pool doors. The scene that greeted me was chaos incarnate. The wind, more violent than I could have anticipated, whipped around me, 
carrying leaves and branches into the tumultuous waters of the pool. I realized with a sinking feeling that this chaos had been raging while I was blissfully unaware, asleep. My eyes, wide and searching the turbulent surface of the pool in a frantic dance, finally landed on the baby. My heart both dropped and soared. There she was, darting frantically around, clearly terrified, her tiny coos of panic almost drowned out completely by the howl of the wind. Without a second thought, I dived into the water. Seeming to immediately sense my presence, the baby made a beeline towards me, seeking protection in the safety of my arms. Clutching the baby close, I made my way out of the pool and ran back inside, suddenly aware of another danger. I had taken the baby out of the water. My mind was a whirlwind as I rushed to my room with the mermaid baby. I had to hide her from my waking parents and find a way to get her back into water. The kitchen sink? No. Too small. Too exposed. The bathtub, then. But as it started to fill, I realized it would take too long. Panicking, I grabbed the largest bucket I could find, running up and down the stairs, shuttling pool water to the tub. Each trip was a race against time, my heart pounding in my chest. As the tub filled, the baby instinctively turned face down, breathing in the water in a desperate attempt to save herself. I watched, breath held, as the baby settled into the water, a profound relief washing over me as I realized the baby was safe, for now. The relief, however, was short-lived as the reality of my situation sank in. Here I was, a makeshift guardian to a mermaid baby, sprinting up and down my house in the dead of night to fill a bathtub with pool water. This is nuts, I breathed. Exhausted but unable to rest, I hovered by the tub, watching over the mermaid baby with apprehension, my mind ablaze with concerns, as I stared at the tiny being now sleeping peacefully in my bathtub. I can't do this, 